Uh, my name is Jacob Pelletier, and I'm one of the community program officers here at Vermont Humanities. And I'm really excited to have you all here for this special event with Amber McBride. Um, I just wanted to say, that, again, thank you for being here and give a little context that we also had a beautiful day up at U32 High School doing some great events there. So I wanted to give a shout out to the school and the Meg Allison, the librarian up there, and all the students that participated in the workshops and uh, Q&A that Amber participated in this today. So just thank you, everyone, for doing this warm welcome and welcoming everyone here to Vermont and having this important dialogue about poetry and writing and expression and what that means. Um, in today's society. Um, so you, for the folks at home as well, thank you for joining on our live stream. Um, this is a part of our Snapshot program, which is a weekly humanities-based program that takes place all over the state, um, but there's always an opportunity to join virtually through the live stream. So feel free to grab some information at our table there about our upcoming programs. Uh, next week, we'll have Ace Learner. Uh, um, the reimagining of barber shops and queer spaces um, to kick off our fall festival. So that'll be online from the Manchester Community Library. Um, and I also want to thank our sponsors for this event, um, especially the generous support of the Kenalog Hubbard Library. So be sure to check out their silent auction in the back there um, and just all the support they did to making this event possible. Um, and you'll hear from Dan shortly as well. Um, and finally, I'd like to thank the entire sponsorship of our snapshot season, uh, the Vermont Department of Libraries, the Institute of Museum of Library Services, and the Alma Gibbs Don Chian Foundation. So thank you for all for that generous support. And now I'll hang it over to Dan. Hi, everyone. Good evening. I'm Dan Groberg. I'm the executive director of the Kellogg Hubbard Library. Uh, it's really an honor to partner with Vermont Humanities to host this evening's program. Uh, our mission is to empower community members to become lifelong learners. And I think today is a perfect illustration of, of us really living into that mission. Uh, as Jacob mentioned earlier today, uh, Amber was giving a writing workshop for 22 uh, eighth grade students uh, at U32. And then we had an assembly with the entire eighth and ninth grade um, at U32, more than 200 students that was also live streamed to five other schools and about 100 students across the state. Um, and then here we are this evening um, with those of you here uh, in person and on online. Um, the library uh, is a nonprofit public library. You may not know that. We're not a municipal library. We are a nonprofit library. And we rely on your support to present programs like this at no cost. So um, please consider making a donation to the library to support our programming uh, and check out our fundraising auction in the back. Um, thank you. And thank you for being here. I'm. Uh, glad to introduce our speaker this evening, Amber McBride. Amber is a former professor at the University of Virginia. She received her BA in English from James, uh, from James Madison University in 2010 and her MFA in poetry from Emerson in 2012. Her debut YA novel in verse, Me Moth, was a finalist for the National Book Award. Uh, and her poetry has appeared in various literary magazines, uh, including Plowshares, uh, Provincetown Arts, many others. Uh, she describes herself as being originally from everywhere, uh, born in Germany, and she spent the first 18 years of her life uh, in many different states uh, traveling the country, moved to Charlottesville, Virginia area in 2018. Uh, her novel in verse, We Are All So Good at Smiling, was released in early 2023. Her newest adult poetry collection, Thick with Trouble, was released in early 2024. And her forthcoming book, Onyx and Beyond, uh, will be released next week, but actually we have some copies here this evening, a uh, special treat for all of you. Um, please check out the Bear Pond uh, table uh, back there. Um, Amber is happy to sign books after the program this evening. Uh, we'll also have a Q&A after the program. Um, so without further ado, Amber McBride, thank you. I'm convinced we get these like very nice introductions to remind us like before we're alive, like, oh, you've done a lot. You've accomplished some things. Um, so I'm gonna talk to you a bit. I might read a few poems if you'd like. And I always have a slideshow, but I don't always go in tandem with my slideshow. So we'll see how that goes. Um, but anywho, I'm really happy to be here. I, it's my first time in Vermont. 
Uh, it's absolutely beautiful. I've been talking about every second how quaint and everything, how everything looks. Um, but I'm originally from uh, everywhere, like I said. My dad is a retired lieutenant colonel. I was born in Germany. I lived in California. I've lived in uh, Boston. And now I settled in Charlottesville, Virginia, which is where my mother is from. I recently resigned as a professor, like I said, at the University of Virginia, which was a really hard decision, but it's also why I've been able to do so many more events um, and tour and go more places, which has been lovely. Um, so today I wanted to talk a little bit about being a writer and being a black queer writer and what that means. And also this idea of when you start writing and you write books and you write, for me, in young adult, adult, uh, in prose and in verse, people start to ask you, well, what kind of writer are you? And I'm like, I, I don't know. I mean, maybe I'll write a thriller. I'm currently working on an adult gothic novel. And I start thinking, like, people are very, like, but what, aren't you supposed to be in a box? Aren't you supposed to be doing one thing? Um, and I was doing an event with my editor, and she asked me a similar question. And I was telling her, I was like, I don't really see myself as a writer, I don't think. I think I see myself as a person who observes the world, and then kind of through that, whatever expression comes, is what I'm supposed to do. Um, and so it made me think a lot about one of my favorite writers, uh, Zora Neale Hurston, uh, who wrote Dust Tracks on the Roads and, and lots of other um, books. But she was a folklorist. Um, technically, a folklorist and an anthropologist are very similar, except folklorists are very concerned about the history of the people as it is told by the people, right? Folklore is the history that is important with the moral attached kind of thing, right? And so uh, the interesting thing about Zora is that she was researching folklore, how black people lived when nobody cared how black people lived. Um, she was recording it, she was writing about it, she was winning, winning awards for it. Um, and so when I think about who I am as a writer, I think I'm a person who's telling stories that I think need to be told after I've experienced so many uh, things, after I've listened. For example, the book that comes out on Tuesday, Onyx and Beyond, is inspired by my dad. It's about a boy who's uh, growing up in Alexandria in DC in the 1970s, and his mother has early onset dementia, and he has to hide it so that he won't have to be taken away. Um, and that is kind of a combination of my dad grew up in DC in this time. Do y'all remember the movie Remember the Titans? Okay, so my dad went to T.C. Williams the year after that. But he was friends with everything. Like we have a, he went to the premiere of the movie in D.C. He's got like a signature from Coach Yotes who says best running back ever. And I was like, he will never let us forget it. Um, but like that's where my dad grew up. And so I was talking to him. I was like, well, where were you when Martin Luther King was assassinated? Like um, what was that like? And I, these conversations started to happen and then, um, my, his mother right now has dementia. Um, she's actually in the hospital right now. And it's interesting because he said to me once, and the entire crooks of the reason I wrote the book, he said, you know, I call my mom three times a day because I say I will, but she won't remember if I do or I don't. And that really hit me. Like, it really hit me that he's doing it because he knows. It has nothing to do with if she remembers or if, if anybody remembers that he called, he does it because he knows. And so the idea for Onyx and Beyond started. Um, I started interviewing my dad about stories when he was growing up. He went to Catholic school, what it was like um, going to Catholic school, how the nuns were very mean to him. They wouldn't give him a part in the nativity play because they said that he was too black, too dark skinned to do it. Um, but he, my dad being the person he is, and that rubbed off on me, kept protesting about it. So they finally let him be the man who said, they went that away. And he talks about it to this day. He was very proud of that. Um, he, despite uh, going to Catholic school, he still is a very, he's a very religious person today. Maybe not specifically a dom denomination, but he's a very religious person. And so um, it's really such a, a privilege to like talk to my dad so much when I was writing Onyx and Beyond because I learned stories I didn't even know about. So every single story I tell in that is, is correct. At one point, Onyx is jumping out of a window on the third story of an apartment building onto a mattress. My dad did that. Um, so like, it's really, really been uh, an interesting thing. And um, the book, Onyx and Beyond, is dedicated to my, my grandmother, Bernadine McBride, who has dementia. Um, so yeah, uh, that, that's one of those things where, once again, 
Zora was collecting information. I'm interviewing my dad and I'm creating a story around it. Um, I'm trying to preserve something um, that feels authentic, um, and which gets me into the idea of why do I write in verse? Uh, and I think that poetry is such a underused tool in literature. I think that we think of things like poetry collections, like my collection Thick with Trouble, but we don't often think of something like We're Also Good at Smiling, which is a plot with a beginning, middle, and end told through poetry, right? And I think that when I write poetry or I decide to use poetry as the median for a particular story, it's usually because I need the audience to feel something I cannot explain. That's when I use poetry. For example, the book Gone Wolf, which is another one that's about let me tell you the premise of Gone Wolf. Gone Wolf is a book where um, a president doesn't believe that he lost an election, and so the southern states leave the rest of the United States, um, and they live in an area called the Bible Boot, where a new form of enslavement is reinstitutionalized. Um, that was the premise. I sold this book six years ago, officially. It didn't come out until last year, and when I sold it, I was told that the plot was unrealistic which I now think it's very funny. Um, so uh, Gone Wolf isn't inverse uh, because the thing I was trying to tell when I was telling, Gone, or telling the story of Gone Wolf wasn't a feeling. It was more of what happens when we keep telling history incorrectly. Um, it was more of a thesis. So I needed that breadth of prose to be able to tell that story. But my other books are all in inverse, um, and they all utilize that. We're Also Good at Smiling is about a girl named Whimsy who has clinical depression, and she has to travel through a haunted garden. Um, how many people here have read Dante's Inferno at some point? Yes, I felt like it would be a lot of people. So this was the inspiration behind that. So like in Dante's Inferno, you're traveling through hell. You have to come out the other side. In this, the, the phrase that is repeated that's also in Dante's Inferno is the only way out is through, to travel through depression. Um, because it's for young adults, it's a little bit more whimsical. Um, instead of circles of hell, we've got different fairy tales. Um, people who are helping her along. We've got Anansi the Spider, we've got Baba Yaga, we've got Mama Wata. Um, but all of them represent this idea that anybody can get stuck in this like place of depression. And in the end, the thesis isn't, oh, I want you to know this. It's more of a feeling of I'm not alone, which is why I wrote it in verse as opposed to uh, prose. Uh, so that's kind of just a little bit about my process. Let me look at my slides to see what I actually came here to talk about. Um, I haven't had one of these um, in a, like since I resigned as a professor. It feels so authoritative with these. It's so much fun. Um, one of my students texted me the other day, because I don't know about y'all, but as a professor, students need so, I don't know, I think it's after the pandemic. Um, they're a bit more needy. So I just give them my number because they tend to have panic attacks very quickly about assignments they know how to do. I'm just confused why they're stressed. And so some of them still have my number. And they were like, hey, um, we're getting coffee on campus. Do you want to come by? I was like, I'm in Vermont. And they're like, see, you're too cool for us now. We told you you were going to do that. And I was like, no, I'll be back. I'll be back in two weeks, I promise. Um, but it's really fun because now I get to go around and like going to the school and hang out with kids. I don't have to grade them. It's so much better. I was starting, I've been a professor for a decade and it was getting to the point where I was like, I don't like telling these kids they need to write differently. I don't know that I believe that there's a special, specific way to write an essay. I think that everybody has their own voice. And so as that started to happen, I was like, I don't know if I belong at the University of Virginia where there is a very strict way. They want you to be writing an essay. Um, so that's why I decided to resign. But I get to hang out with students now and not grade them and hang out with my old students and see where they're going. And that's much more exciting for me. Oh, do you have a question now? Yes, go ahead. Oh. Okay, that's a great that's a great segue. So yes, I am happy to tell you what poetry is. I can't define it. That's the answer. I don't think anybody can define it, right? I was just at the uh, school and I was like, so rap music, Kendrick Lamar. Does anybody in here listen to Kendrick Lamar? He's a rapper. If you haven't, Kendrick Lamar is the only rapper to have won a Pulitzer Prize for his rap music. That is how good this man is at rapping. Um, and he doesn't use in rhyme. He uses internal rhyme, which is an entire different kind of class that we would go into if we were talking about that. But 
This idea of what poetry is is something we have to deconstruct because the people who decided what poetry is were straight, straight white men. That's just a fact, right? And so when we start bringing everybody else into this, we have to create a community where we can say that poetry are these other things. Um, and when we say poetry is one thing, kids start not liking it, right? They start thinking, this isn't for me. I don't like Shakespeare. I didn't like Shakespeare until I was like 25. Like, and that, now I love Shakespeare. Now I'm a fan of Shakespeare. But if I start out with Shakespeare, why would you like, what's the first thing you show a kid is Shakespeare? Are they going to love Shakespeare? No, they don't have the time. They don't have the, they don't care what Shakespeare's talking about. Um, and so if the first thing you say is your favorite rapper, let's look at their lyrics and see where they're using metaphors that becomes a more interesting assignment. And then they start looking for poetry themselves. Um, so I never define poetry. I think that poetry is what you decide. I was telling students, I was trying to get the football players to be interested in uh, poetry. And I was like, you know when, and I know nothing about football, y'all. I don't, it's not my thing. I was like, you know when the quarterback like throws the ball and then like he's, that person who's supposed to catch it, catches it, and they're like naming the things. I don't know who, what position that is. And um, it's perfect, and they run it in for a touchdown, and everybody's screaming, and there's this feeling we all have goosebumps. They were like, yeah. I was like, that's poetry. That moment is poetry because it makes you feel something you cannot explain, right? When you read a Mary Oliver poem, like, and she, what is it, Wild Geese, that one's been in my head lately. Um, and that line, when you're a person who has clinical depression and you think that you're not good because you have, you have all these privileges, but you're still sad. And the first line of that is, you do not have to be good. Like, that is such a, de like, a declaration. Poetry touches you in a way that you cannot explain. And so to define it, it is to give it a disservice, right? Like, we can continue to change the definition of poetry. And I think that, for me, I was a, also a ballet dancer. Dancing was a type of poetry for me. Um, sometimes still every, people ask me about my process. If I can't figure out a line, I'll dance and then write the line. Somehow through that movement, I've figured out what I want to say. Um, so I think that that definition, the constraints of poetry, uh, are useless in the sense of when we're trying to introduce people to poetry. Now, if you're studying poetry, yes, you're going to learn how do you write a sonnet, what's a haiku, what's a palindrome, what's a rhyme scheme. You need to know all the rules so that you can then break them correctly. Um, you know, that's important. But I think that when you're starting out, if we're starting about talking about young people, we have got to stop being pretentious when it comes to poetry. Um, at least that's what I think. Okay, let's see. We'll do more questions at the end. I promise. I promise. Um, oh, no, I did it backwards. Yay. Okay, those are just some of my books. I already talked about that. Um, and these are the ones that are coming. So Poemhood, are there any teachers here? Hi, thank you for what you do. Um, Poemhood is a fun one because uh, it's an anthology. It's an anthology of all black poets, um, living, young, and uh, ancestors is what we call them. So like we got the rights to like uh, Lucille Clifton's poem and that's in there with some other poets. Um, Kwame Alexander is in here. There's a lot of different uh, black poets talking about the black experience. I mention that because if you only can get one book, it's got about 35 poets in there. Nikki Giovanni's in there. Um, I could just list off some really big names. It's very impressive. But it was very, it very much of a headache. My co-editors, uh, Taylor Bias and Erica Martin, the way that we were collecting rights and begging estates to let us use some of these poems. But in the end, it's, it came into this nice thing. I, and we do, we do have that back there as well. Um, let's see. Oh, and Thick with Trouble is my poetry collection, my first adult poetry collection with Penguin Poets. Um, and that's where I guess I finally, because I, I went into young adult first for lots of reasons, if you have questions about that later, um, it's, I decided to do an adult poetry collection because I think that often people think, why do you write for young adults? Because you can't write for adults. And I write for young adults because I think young adults are much more interesting. Um, I think that they give you more space to be creative. And so I kind of wrote Thick with Trouble, didn't know if I was going to publish it, um, and then an editor at Penguin did like it. So that one is my adult poetry collection. Let's see. Backwards, I went backwards. Okay, 
So this is, I always put some pictures because I feel like pictures are fun. When we talk about the like written word and telling stories and folklore and everything, I think that so much of yourself is in poetry. Uh, I think that you can't write good poetry without putting some of your own heart into it. You think of like, we were talking about Mary Oliver, her passion for nature. Nobody writes about nature like Mary Oliver does. Um, that's so much part of her, of her experience. Um, and so for me, I uh, am black clearly, and I'm queer, and I also practice hoodoo, which is an African-American folk magic system. It's not the same as voodoo, if you all want a lesson in that. Voodoo is a religion, hoodoo is a practice. Um, hoodoo was created when Af enslaved African-Americans were not allowed to practice their own indigenous culture things, and so they created this new, uh, I guess, idea of what religion was for them using Native American, African, and Christianity and all mixed together. There's a lot of herbalism in it as well, but it's called hoodoo. Uh, it's something that I practice. It's something that Zora also researched called hoodoo in America. And at one point, hoodoo was so prevalent that the president of the United States, I forgot which president it was, literally had what they call a mojo bag for his health in his pocket. Um, so hoodoo is prevalent. It still is. But it was pushed underground when it became illegal and people were saying that... Um, you couldn't practice it, you could be arrested for practicing it. And essentially how herbalists now get kind of harped on for things. I was telling students that uh, there was a spider in my apartment, or like in the hotel I'm staying at, at, and I was saying like, I don't really love to kill spiders, but I wasn't gonna let the spider chill in the room and I wasn't gonna take it outside because I have arachnophobia. Um, but I was telling them that if you mix peppermint oil cinnamon and water and a little bit of dish soap and you spray around your house, it repels spiders because they don't like how it feels. So they won't even come in your house. So you don't have to kill them. And I was like, that's some hoodoo for you. It also keeps out evil. So there's one. Um, I've got everyone I know using the peppermint trick and they were like spiders. And I live in the country, y'all. I live on 40 acres of land. Um, and I don't, I don't, I rarely see spiders. I'm going to knock on wood now because I feel like I'm going to go home there's going to be a spider like right in the center of the hall, right? Um, after I said that. Um, but yeah, it's, a, it's a, a really wonderful system. And I'm currently getting my degree in medicinal herbalism to learn more and to be able to work with that a bit more. Um, I keep forgetting the which way. Oh, wait, my favorite thing about that, going back forward. Um, I want to point out me. I'm right here in the corner. Can you tell that I was doing too much as a kid? Like, that was a family reunion. Um, my sister is also in the matching outfit. But I just look like I'm about to just run in the woods and do something I'm not supposed to be doing. Um, but yeah, I, I love that photo. Um, so we talked about this. Uh, when you talk about telling people a story, uh, which is what we do when we tell stories. Let me do a time check. Oh, we're good. Um, when we tell stories is... I think when you say you're going to tell someone a story, you kind of tell, you're telling them a bit about like a part of yourself, right? You know, when like you, I know everyone's had this experience when someone older than them is telling, whether it was a grandparent or an aunt or a great aunt is telling them a story and you're like in it, right? And they're telling you and they're really giving you a history that you get to keep and tell someone else eventually, right? And this becomes this like almost sacred process of the way that we tell stories. That's how we kept history forever. We have to remember like the written word did not come around until like almost 50,000 years after the, spoke, or the spoken word, which is interesting on how we record things. Um, but that idea of when I, you tell someone's story, I try to keep that same kind of intimacy when I write books of, I really want it to feel like I'm like sitting down in a rocking chair telling you something that you feel privileged to know. Um, and so when I tell people that uh, in poetry, I often use the example of, when you tell someone you love your dad, you're like, okay, everybody, most people like their dads unless they were horrible, which I'm sorry if they were. Um, but you kind of feel that. You're like, okay, that, that is, that's something that's important. But if I tell you a story about my dad and then I tell you I love my dad, you understand it in a completely different way, right? Because I've given something of him. Uh, so that leads into, I'm gonna tell you a story about my dad. He's gonna, if he's watching, hi dad. <laughs> I don't know if he's watching. He's probably out doing something interesting. There's my dog, okay. 
we're obsessed with each other. All right, that's my dad. Like I said, he's a retired lieutenant colonel. So I'm gonna tell you a bit of a story about him. Um, first of all, we're besties. We hang out all the time. When my parents retired and moved to Charlottesville, they were like, Amber, move to Charlottesville with us. And I was like, okay. And so I've lived with my parents for the last six years, which has been the biggest privilege of my life. I, I talk about this as I see people um, losing family members or anything. And I'm like, I've spent so much time with my parents. I'm never, I have so many stories. I'm never gonna regret this time that I've spent with them. Uh, I enjoyed living with them so much that I bought land right beside them so that when I build my house, I'll still be like, hey mom, hey dad. Um, but so my dad is a really interesting man. He grew up, like I said, in Washington DC and Alexandria. Um, and he uh, is just hilarious if you've ever met him. He's, he's got a lot of dad jokes. Um, and so when we, my sister and I were in high school, um, 9-11 happens and my dad is called out of the reserves uh, and told that he has to serve. Uh, and that was a really difficult time for my sister and I. And so he serves, so my senior year, my dad is gone the entire time. Um, he comes back and when he's doing his like out processing, they realize that he has prostate cancer, which is, you know, scary, but they tell him, it's not gonna be a difficult surgery. Like, it's, you, we're just gonna remove your prostate, if that can be easy, and then um, you're gonna go through radiation therapy and it's gonna be okay. And so we were like, okay, and so my, at this time, I was in my second year at James Madison University, and my mom was like, it's not a difficult surgery, you don't need to come home, we'll call you when everything's done. So my dad's father, he went there, and my mom was at the hospital. And so I was, like I said, my dad and I are really, really close, and so I was just sitting there and I was thinking about him while he was like under for surgery. And I was remembering one of my favorite stories that he told me, which is also in Onyx and Beyond, um, where <laughs> he lived with his grandmother for a little while. And my dad was a rambunctious kid. I would put a picture up here, but he, told, he didn't sign off on any of the pictures I had. So he, um, <laughs> I'm laughing because it's so funny. He would basically, not wake up for school. The problem was, my dad, like most pe people who live in the city, really like to sleep in. He said it's a city thing. And, because my mom is from the country, she'll wake up before the sun and be fine. And I'm like, that's too much. But anywho, so my dad said for school, his uh, grandmother would call his name once and be like, wake up. And he would be like pretending not to hear her. And then she would yell his name one more time and he would pretend again. And then like in true like Southern grandma way, she would bust in there and say, if you don't get up right now, Mario, and he would jump up and be like, I was up, I was up. And he would go to school. And I was thinking about that story um, when I was waiting for you know, a call back about what was happening with my dad. Um, the thing is, is that he was supposed to only be in surgery for an hour and it had been two hours and then it had been three hours and then it had been four hours. And at this point, my sister calls me and she's like, I think something's wrong. And I was like, I think something's wrong too. Um, so my sister and I are like getting ready to figure out how we're gonna drive six hours and get there and everything. And then my mom finally calls us and she says, everything's okay now, but your dad was put under and because my dad has such big muscles, but he's like smaller stature, like five, six, they gave him too much anesthesia and they couldn't wake him up. Um, and they had no idea how to wake him up. It wasn't, nothing was working. And so, I talked to my dad on the phone. He is, there's something about when you see your dad weak for the first time. Um, but he was like, I'm okay, I'm doing okay. And I was like, all right. And his dad was there with him. And so I went home and he was telling me he was fine and everything, he was recovering. And it wasn't until about two months later, he was like, I wanna tell you a story, Amber. And I was like, okay. Um, and my dad and I are like really close, like I said. My dad and I talk about things that we first to each other that we wouldn't talk about to other people. And he was like, so when I was under, and I couldn't wake up. I distinctly remember floating above my body. And he said, I distinctly remember a beautiful light that I did no problem going towards. I was, it had every intention of going towards it. But then I heard my grandmother yell my name once, twice, and on the third time, I woke up back in my body and the doctors had already thought there's nothing else we can do. And so I thought about how I was thinking about that story. 
and how he was thinking about that story and how his grandmother, who isn't with us present in a body, but somehow spiritually found a way to make sure he got back to his family is something that I, I cherish. And that's when I say there's things you can't put words to. Some things just give you goosebumps and you can't explain it. Um, and that particular story is one of those things. And so when I say I practice hoodoo, when I say I'm a poet, when I say I'm a folklorist, I think it means that I believe in life in ways that I can't explain. And I'm okay with not being able to explain it. Um, I'm okay with whatever happened to make sure that my dad is here with me now and healthy. Um, and so now when I tell you I love my dad, it feels a bit different than when I told you the first time because I told you a story that made you feel um, invited in, a part of me. And I think that, and I hope that I leave parts of that in, in all of my work. Um, okay, I think we're almost at questions. Would y'all like to, would you want, do you want me to read a poem? Do we? Okay. All right. Do we want one? Let's do the poetry collection. I get to read from that the least. So, so Thick With Trouble is a poetry collection that is told from the perspective of a lot of Southern women who I have been, were, was raised by. So my grandmother had 13 brothers and sisters, and all of them had kids. I have a very big family. Um, and this particular, last week, uh, the oldest member of our family, my Aunt Mildred, passed away. But she was 94, 94 years old. And um, so all of the women who helped raise me, this is kind of like an ode to them, um, because I think we often see trouble as a bad thing, but um, John Lewis talked about good trouble, there's good kinds of trouble. Um, and so I, am ki I was trying to reinvent that idea of that name. All right. Now the question is, which one do I wanna read? Okay, we'll read the opening poem. It's called Roll Call, New Tarot Names for Black Girls. Call us something lovely, mischief changing robes. Call us hardened honey's brownness on the tip of the tasting spoon. Brown hands cradling inherited softness or head cook in a country church hymning. It's cold, darling, come inside, make a cream colored psalm of me. Call me gospel. I don't mind harboring millions of maybes at once. Call a steak knife to clean meat from between teeth or a steak knife to skin prey. Pray we don't snare you. Cornbread crafted from spoiled milk or nickel-nicked knuckles. Fault lines haunting thighs. Crimson, crimson eggs nesting in wait between breasts. Been called liars in midnight's evil twin. Deceits blossom like fungi. Black girl will hatch a long red snake thing, a bloody cord that will strangle on command. Black girl will sin with anything with half a heartbeat, even a disease. That's fine. Call us pestilence's hands, edging Atlas, the reason he begs and drops it all. Call us end of days or pretty despite the blackness. Come into my soft coffin, my mouth buzzing flies. Touch my heart strum one more time. I don't mind. I offer the death card to everyone, been called trouble, that good, good kind. So it's kind of a declaration in, I don't really care what you think about me, um, kind of thing of, of being a black woman and being told you're too this, too loud, too angry, and then you can't be too soft or too anything. And it was kind of saying, I don't really care. Um, I'm not gonna cuss in church, but kind of like, you know. Uh, Y'all know. I'll do one more. Uh, I have one in mind. It's called... One second. I didn't even think about reading. I just saw all of you here today, and I was like, maybe we will read something. It's a moth one, because I was like, let's keep being obsessed with moths. When you haven't read from your... Ooh. Oh, I like this one, too. <laughs> Which one do we want to do? Uh, it's also divided in sections uh, with reimagined tarot cards, um, if you're into that. I pulled a card today. I pulled, um, what did I? I pulled the devil, but reversed, which I really just means 
I'm about to fly on a plane and travel is going to be annoying, really, traveling back home. Um, let's see. I can't find the one I'm thinking of. Oh, here it is. Perfect. It's called Ghost Moth. Naturalists tried to catch them by showering pellets, strangely elusive, they hardly fell like snow or sleet or medium-sized hail from the sky. They flew just darty enough, reached just high enough, seduced the space between tree branches, branches just enough. The truth is their bodies are so thin compared to their wings. By shrinking themselves for years, the bullets just missed their black souls. Naturalists called them witches or ghosts, because anything that dodges death that much ain't all the way human, which is also why naturalists don't mind killing them. All right, uh, I think we can open to questions now, if there are any questions. Oh, we're, you're gonna get a Good mic. Phone. Just something you mentioned about how like, all you want, there was no one correct way to write an essay. Are you familiar with a book called Bending Genre? I can't remember who wrote it, but... I haven't. I haven't heard of that book. But is it basically about the genre that you work in doesn't have to be? It's the... Basically, mi mi yeah, mix matching content and form when writing. Um, and so, yeah, basically, like... Writing an essay as a poem. Writing a poem as, as an essay. Yes. Is that my mic? Something oh, it's because like two are happening so at once. When you were talking about, like, there's no one correct way to write an essay, it reminded me of that. And it's a very interesting book. I, w I will definitely check that out. Thank you. Oh. Hi. Th uh, this is. This one? Okay. Um, the, uh, earlier you talked about the heightened anxiety level among your students coming out of the pandemic, which I think is something anybody who's been in classroom the last couple of years uh, notices. And I wonder about that in terms of young writers uh, coming up and the things that you inevitably encounter as you establish yourself as a writer, including um, what will seem like a ridiculous level of rejection. Um, so what advice, um, you know, you've got some uh, college students in here, so uh, what, what advice or what thoughts do you have for younger writers um, about dealing with that in, so, in a world that's already uh, really kind of scary? Right. That's a great, great question, thank you. Um, I think that when you're young, developing this, the idea of like what your voice is and understanding that it is unique. And so in some instances, for example, um, I did count my rejections because I, it's, it was a lot. Um, but I was rejected over 152 times for agents, another 60 times for books. Um, some of the books that were rejected are books that are now published. That just shows you it has nothing to do with your skill. It has to do with like finding that one reader who understands. And so when it comes to rejection, I think you have to look at it as that wasn't the right fit. That wasn't the right person. Um, but also know that you're doing something very specific. And if you're doing it in a way that feels authentic, it's going to take a little longer because you're break You're not doing what everyone else is doing, right? You're creating a new space for what that has to be. And when you establish that space in an honest way, people don't expect things from you anymore. So, like, when I have a book coming out, nobody, nobody, like, is worried. They're like, "Is it young adult? Cool. Is it adult? Cool. Is it sci-fi mixed with fantasy? Sure. For Gone Wolf." And they're like, they don't expect it because they know my books do weird things. But if I had changed the way I wrote. Um, to try to get in and then did that, I don't think I would have a career that I have. I don't think I would have the success that I've had. Um, but I think it's really authentically knowing that and trusting your own voice because nobody can tell you your voice isn't relevant, just like your story is always relevant. Um, but it's really difficult because there's no way around the amount of rejection when it comes to wanting to publish in a way that is traditional. Um, there's always self-publishing as well, which is an option. But uh, 
I just say like keep reading, keep writing, um, and keep trusting your own voice and developing that. Yeah. I heard, I listened to Me Moth on my Libby app. Mm -hmm. And I turned around at the end and listened to it again. <laughs> it is magical to hear you reading that book. Uh, it just took me into a space I have no words for. Thank you so much. And uh, so I'm a fan, and I'm thrilled that you're here. <laughs> Thank you. That means so much. I. Um... I had a speech impediment when I was younger, so anytime someone compliments my audiobook, I'm, I'm thrilled. Uh, that means so much to me, thank you. Hi, thank you for coming. I was just curious if you, could, if you would be willing to share a little bit about your relationship with your mother. Oh, I'm always happy to talk about my mother. Okay. <laughs> I just never get the chance. No, my mother is an extraordinary human being. Um, so my mom grew up in the country in Charlottesville, Virginia. And she um, grew up with a, a, single, a single mom and helped raise her two brothers. My mother had to grow up much earlier than she should have. She was cooking meals at eight and nine for her brothers, making sure they got to school. But my, my mother is the fav my favorite thing about my my dad mom dynamic, they met in college. My mom didn't want kids. So when my parents got married, my mom was like, I just wanna make sure you understand that. I don't want children. And my dad was like, bet, no problem. He was playing the long game. Um, eventually, eventually about after, I think it was eight years, they were married eight years. Um, and my mom saw how good my dad was with kids uh, and was like, okay, you can have one kid. Um, but before, a little bit more about my mom, before she, they tried to start having my sister, Megan, I'm the youngest. Uh, she had my dad sign a contract saying that uh, anytime the kids cr cried, he would get up. Anytime they needed formula, he would get up. And if they ever had anything ever had to happen with like job stuff, he would, you know, take care of us. My dad ended up being a stay at home dad for two years because of this contract at one point. Um, and to this day, when we have something that's like um, anything serious, we call my mom, anything that's like, Ooh, there's a spider. I had a nightmare, we call my, my dad. But my mom was a businesswoman. She's a breadwinner in our family. Um, we've moved for her job more than we moved for my dad's job. Uh, and she's one of the most uh, tenacious women I, I know. I love, I, love, I love her very much. We have a, when you have two, uh, I think my dad I talk about a lot because my dad is so chill. When you have two personalities, everyone knows this, there's a transition when you're a kid into an adult and how your relationship with your mother changes. And you gotta put work into it if you want it to change in a positive way. Um, and when you have two people who are headstrong, it's interesting. Um, but it's the one thing that people talk about why my mother and I are so close, because um, we are pretty inseparable, it's that I have enough of my dad in me where I'm just like, I let her win. But she is a bossy woman and we love her. Um, a cool story about my mom is that she apparently, my mom is so smart. My mom started reading before she was one. This is what her mother says, okay? The, I swear the number does get younger every time I hear the story, but we'll go with that. Um, and she recited all of uh, Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech at like a thing when she was like 10 years old. So then when my sister and I were 10, she made us do the same thing, except we got to split it down the middle so we each memorized half. And so she had us memorizing it for a year um, where before dinner we had to say our sections and like by the end of the time when it was like Black History Month, we were at church, we were performing, we did the whole thing um, when we were like, I think I was 12 and my sister was like 13, 14. Um, so my mother is a woman who believes in you fiercely and then expects you to live up to that, that expectation. I was a dancer, I, like I said, for ballet and I, she would come to every recital and sometimes she'd be like, why did you look at the girl that one time? I was like, I didn't, know the choreography. She was like, well, then we need to practice more. So she's this woman who has made me um, into a woman who I can handle any kind of critique. My editors are like, I'm sorry. I'm like, I d nothing's going to upset me. Um, and if she's listening, she's going to be mad. Uh, <laughs> this particular book right here, we're also good at smiling. Uh, I, my mom is my first reader. 
I don't trust my editor with my work or anything. My mother reads my books before anybody else. And so I had her read it, read it and I was nervous about it because I was writing about something like clinical depression, which I have a serious, I, I have. And I was like, what did you think about it? And she sat down and she was like, I really don't like this book. And I was like, okay, what, what about it don't you like? And she was like, it feels inauthentic. I know I've seen what you've gone through and I feel like you're cutting edges. Um, and I was like, okay, you're right. Um, and then I went back to the drawing board, dismantled the book, reassembled it in two weeks, gave it to her and now it's her favorite one. So she's a woman where like she, does, she doesn't critique needlessly, um, but everything she says you can really ex like understand that she wants you to do better. Um, so yeah, you get me started talking about my mom. I, I, I adore my mother, very close. Thank you for asking, I don't talk about her as much. Hi, first I, first I wanna say thank you uh, for talking about living with your parents. Um, I got the gift of living with my son for a year and a half, mm. just recently, and it was just amazing. It's so nice. Um, I just think, I wish more people understood that it's not like a crutch, it's a gift. Yeah. Um, so thanks for talking about that. My question is, um, I know you don't have a lot of control over your covers, mm -hmm. but is there a story behind the cover of Thick With Trouble? There is, and it said I got to pick that one. Um, the only one, so uh, first of all, thank you for sharing that. Living with your parents, if you ever get the opportunity, like for example, I'm gonna fly back home, right? And my dad's gonna pick me up and my mom's gonna be like, your favorite meal is already ready. You know what I mean? Like it's, it's something, they love you different. And also you don't settle, everyone says my parents spoil me, that's why I'm single. And I was like, probably, I don't need anyone. My parents know how to treat me. Um, but yeah, so Thick With Trouble, it's actually a painting called Marie Antoinette is Dead um, from a, a artist or an artist and she has an entire collection. And so I saw the painting and I lost my mind. I was like, this is beautiful. And so I told Penguin, and they went to try to get her to say yes, and she did. And th so this is like an original art piece that you can see. It's actually gonna be in DC, I think next year. Like, extremely talented artist. Um, so yeah, that was the only one. All the others are from like scratch. They're not from artists, so that's kind of like they're building them, and it's like, hopefully you like it, but all of my cover artists have been amazing. I, I feel so lucky. When you like line up my covers, I'm like, I'm just, so lucky to have such beautiful artists working on my covers. They just get it. I love it. Hi. Hi. <laughs> um. I just want to say it's like a, a privilege to have you here. It's really amazing to, to see you here and to hear your story. Um, I'm here with a group from Norwood at Chum, a recent graduate. Uh, I just got my degree in English and with a minor in writing, and so um, seeing you up here is just like um, it's a lot. It's it's very special for me, and hearing your passions is like I feel like I'm like looking in a mirror in a way, and I just very much feel seen, mm. and um, it's just uh, I I just feel very grateful to be here. And I really hope that I can like catch you afterwards because yeah. I have a lot to say and I do not want to take up <laughs> I'm a yapper. I have a lot of thoughts. I'm a yapper. So, uh, but I just really wanted to say I'm, I'm very privileged to be here and to like catch this. This was, you know, I'm very privileged that Kim broadcast this on campus because I definitely wouldn't have been here. So, very blessed to be here. <laughs> Thank you. First of all, um, I feel seen is, I'm not going to cry. I will not. I'm holding it, we got it, um, is, is such a, a beautiful thing because I, I feel like for me as a poet, um, for so much of my career, I, I didn't feel seen. There were no like younger poets I was looking up to and um, I was really blessed in the same way when, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with Furious Flower uh, Poetry Center in, at James Madison University where Dr. Joanne Gabin used to be the director. Um, out of grad school, she hired me there, and it's a black poetry um, place, and it's the only reason I'm standing here today, honestly, because when I went to grad school, it, it took away my voice so much to be the only, except for one other, black poet in the program, um, and to be so not understood, that if I hadn't been like 
engulfed in people who I thought saw me afterwards, I don't know that I would have been able to rebuild up my voice. Grad school gave me all the, you know, the technical things I needed, but in a way it took away my voice. So um, it always means so much when you say, I feel seen because it, it means so much to see someone doing the thing that you want to do. So thank you. And thank you for being here. Yeah. Yes, we'll get you the mic. Uh, I'm going to start with a little story. Oh, uh, we get a story. Like your dad's story. Denise and I got into the canoe and paddled north in Lake Champlain to Basin Harbor where John Hartford, famous southern songwriter, performer, near the end of his career was, was giving a concert. Mm -hmm. How did we miss him? for our whole lives. And now, listening to your presentation, where, where do I start? What book should I read first? What do you recommend as, uh, the, as the right place to start? Out of my books? Yes. Oh. Uh, I think that the book that I did everything I wanted in and I feel proud of and never would edit is my first book, which was Me Moth, this one. Um, the reason this one is it is because it would have been my first book that sold. And when, <laughs> when we talk about the amount of rejection, it was after I said, you know what, I really don't care anymore. I'm going to write whatever I want. And I wrote this in a m a less than a month and was like, nobody's going to want this. This is like so much of who I am. And my editor, Liz Sabla and McMillan, loved it. Uh, and it was, yeah, it was the first book where I, I did everything I wanted. I put in my spirituality, my personality, uh, and it, it all seemed to come together. So I always suggest, suggest Me Moth. Um, my second suggestion is always whatever one you want, because I feel like all the others kind of also, you'll, you'll get it. Um, I do think that Gone Wolf is my most, quote, political book, but... I think that all my books are investigating something, what it means to be black in America, which is political in itself. And so, um, but Me Moth is my, it's my baby. And I love, I love that book. Every time, it's also the book when I go into, I'm not gonna like give anything away, um, but I, I go into schools and kids literally yell at me about the end. Not in a mean way, but in a, oh my gosh, kind of way. And I love it. So um, yeah, Me Moth. Thank you for asking that. Thank you so much for being here today, and I'm so excited also to read your work after this. I had a question about writing for young adults, especially after your, your comment earlier around um, what you're seeing working with students mm -hmm. at this moment in time. Yeah. I'm curious if when you're working on a young adult novel, if you're thinking about or positioning it with what the generation is experiencing right mm -hmm. now, yeah. Like, is that part of your process or, um, yeah, I'd just be curious to hear about that. I think it's part of my process in the sense of like, I f when you're around young people, you're so tuned into what they're feeling. Um, I think in college in a different way where they feel like they can express it. I feel like in high school, you're still like, I don't need anybody. In college, they're much more like wanting to talk about your feelings. And so, yeah, I do. I put a lot of that in my books. Um, Gone Wolf talks about the pandemic and the ramifications of what happens after that. In Gone Wolf, um, there's loss from the pandemic in it, um, but it also talks about like the things that were happening during the pandemic. Um, and mental health is a, a huge topic for young people right now. I, I don't know if you know like how, um, I believe now that uh, self-harm is like one of the reasons the second reason why young people pass away like it's it's very prevalent and we still don't talk about it as much as we should which is why I wrote we're all why are we're all so good at smiling um, and I, I find that it's it's one of those things where you you see what's happening you kind of I kind of look of how that's working in my life and say is there a story here are there characters that are coming to light and when I start to see a character very clearly that's usually when I like sit down um, and start writing but also I've been writing in verse a lot more I had been wanting to write some more prose but verse is so much more accessible for the shorter attention spans that 
uh, young people have right now. A uh, verse novel is about 15 to 20,000 words, and you know, a prose book can be 50 to 75,000 words. Um, so I think the accessibility in it being brief or being able to read a poem and set it down is also something I try to work with, um, when, especially when we talk about like reluctant readers. Um, but yeah, thank you. Hello. Hi. Um, how did you know that writing was for you? Such a simple question. How did I know that writing was for me? She's like hidden with the, the hardest question, in like a few words. I'm like, I don't. Um, a fun story. I was, a, was not always an English major in college, I was pre med. Um, and then I always wrote poetry. My very first poem I wrote when I was 12. Um, I have it memorized. Like, it was like, I don't know where it came from. Uh, and I, I never was taught that writing could be something for a black girl to do. Like, I, there weren't like super famous black writers. Uh, there, was, there was no like example um, of that. And so I also always knew I wanted to help people. And I was really good at I, math or like science and everything. And so I was like, I'm gonna be a doctor. Um, and so I went to school, I did almost all the pre-med classes, and then my junior year I got into a car accident, it wasn't a bad one, but I was in a hospital, because my mom was like, you're gonna go to the hospital whether you feel fine or not, because we're gonna make sure you get a check from insurance, and you're gonna make sure that you went to the hospital, and I was okay. So I was sitting in the hospital, and I was like, I really hate it here. <laughs> I really don't like hospitals. I'm like realizing in this moment, this might not be for me, because all my internships had been at like, uh, drawing blood, helping with lab stuff, and I was like in the hospital, and I was like, I don't like it. And so I went home, and I was like, how am I going to tell my parents that I want to switch to English with creative writing and African studies? How am I going to? My parents paid for my undergrad, so like it was even more stressful conversation. Um, and so yeah, I, I told my parents that, and I kind of never looked back. I was always a writer. I just never knew I could create a career out of it. And so in true my mom fashion, she was like, you can switch your major if you write down your 10 year plan and how you're gonna get there. So I, I, I took a week, I delivered that to her. She said, this looks adequate. And she was like, you can switch, you can switch your major. And I did. And I, I've stayed to the plan, give or take a couple years. So it's good. I was like, thanks mom, thanks for that template. Thank you. Did you know that your mom is my mom? No, <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> They're the same person. Wait, that's adequate. That's adequate. Um, I was going to ask, do you find that as a young adult writer, sometimes you write something and people go, that should be in young adult just because there is a young adult in it? Yeah, that's and Does amazing. that drive you as nuts as it drives me? It does. It does. Because, um, right, young adult has nothing to do with the age range. It has much more to do with the topic you're talking about, right? Um, so yeah, I get a little annoyed. That's the same way I get annoyed about genre, right? Like Onyx and Beyond is about my dad, 1960s dementia. So they're gonna say this is historical fiction. It's not historical fiction. It's like an autobiographical kind of thing, you know? So like at some point you're just like, do what you want. If you like the book, great. If not, oh well. Um, but yeah, I think that it's interesting because like my the gothic novel which I'm working on is adult, but the main character is 15. So, the things that I'm writing about in that I would never put into a goth, uh, to, into a uh, young adult book. Um, and we see that all the time with like, there's literally what is it? Stephen King's Carrie. How old is she? She's like 16. So like that's not a, a young adult book. <laughs> I hope they're not promoting that as young adults. So um, I think people kind of like, they, that's like the easy way. But anybody who likes reading, they, they figure out really quickly that it can transition. And that young adult books are also for adults and vice versa. Like, I think that that's the thing. I, I still go back and read the Narnia series was like my, my thing when I was young. Um, and so I, every year I read, I read it still because it makes me, oh, nostalgia is so, so good. So, um, and I, I think that what's really beautiful is I get something different from it every time as an adult. Like there's something else I'm seeing. I'm seeing the message that C.S. Lewis as an adult wanted adults to see in it. And when you're a child, you see something else. And that's the really, really beautiful thing about really well-written 
young adult um, that I, I really love. Like when you think about books like The Giver, like when you read that when you're older, you see something different than when you were younger, but it's profound both times. Same with like picture books, Charlotte Webb, Charlotte's Webb. Like y'all are getting me too passionate again. Yes. I'm getting excited about my favorite things. Um, but no, yeah, I think that we all interact with literature, and I, I trust that people who want to interact with it will find the terminology in the books that are best for them. Yeah, I think this will be our last question. Thanks for being here. Thank you for coming. I've been thinking about how you said you left academia, and your presence, and the, the way you're presenting everything, you're so good at this, at teaching, right? And I, and I feel like what a disservice for your students not to have that. And I, But yet I totally understand why you would leave with the whole, that's not the structure I want to teach, and I want to be creative, and, and how institutions are kind of like ironing that out of maybe the good teachers, I would say. And, and at the same time, I'm going to point out that as soon as you said you left, and I thought, oh, well, there's a place for her at like Goddard College, but they just closed, you know, I don't know if you know Goddard. So all these like liberal creative institutions are closing, mm. and then teachers like you might be leaving the more structured kind. So maybe if you want to talk about that, or if you're planning on going back to teaching and where you might, might go. Um, I'm happy to talk a little bit more about that when we're not recording because of the University of Virginia. Um, but I will say that it wasn't, 100% on my own accord. It was a lot of, uh, I think that when you're a black professor, a young black professor, uh, I was one of the only professors teaching, one, a 3-3 schedule, but in writing, creative writing, and in literature, which is three different preps. So anyone who's a teacher knows that like that's a lot. Um, and I was just burnt out. And so I asked for some accommodations and some conversations happened. And in the end, my students understood. And I was really proud because I had come to UVA, um, and I was there for four years fully. I was at JMU before and then community college. Um, and I think what I've realized is I like community college better, I, uh, for me, for the way that I teach. Um, but my students were graduate. the students who came in with me were graduating the year I was leaving. So I was at their graduation. It felt like we all went through a cycle together. Um, I love teaching. I already miss it. Uh, so I do think, it will definitely be in my future. Where? I'm not sure yet. Um, but I do think that the teachers on all levels who really are there for young people, sometimes these rules are put in place and it's a, it's a disservice um, because you got to remember, like, all kids don't learn the same. And sometimes you got to try different things. And being a good teacher is, like, understanding that. Um, and also being a good teacher, last thing I want to say, and it's also about writing for young adults, too, is that... I look at young adults as completely fully formed humans. Like, I don't think I know more than them. I don't think I'm more intelligent than them. I believe that they have their own ideas and opinions that are valid. What I'm trying to teach them is how are you articulating those ideas so that you can say your feelings, right? Um, and so I think that that level of respect for young people is also why I love writing for young people. I think they're absolutely extraordinary. And so if I didn't end up back in a classroom, I'd be I'd very, very surprised. Um, but thank you for that. Thank you all for coming. This has been lovely. Great. Thank you so much, Amber. It's been a pleasure spending these past few days with you and your generosity to our, to our state here in Vermont. So I hope it's not your last journey. Vermont's my new favorite place now. <laughs> it's a regular longer trip, yeah. Right? <laughs> Um, for those who are staying for the book signing, we'll get the table set up shortly. Um, once the line forms, we'll be giving out um, post-it notes with pens so you can uh, kind of prep your personalizations ahead of time for Amber, so that works a little smoothly. Um, but yeah, give us a little patience and we'll be right there with you. But thank you again all for coming this evening. Thank you.